I've lived everywhere, man, in Texas anyway, from Waco to Lubbock, Corpus to El Paso, Dallas to San Antonio, with Houston in between. From the defenders of the Alamo centuries ago to Medal of Honor winners of today, we don't ever want to forget the contributions our Mexican-American forefathers have made to enrich the lives of all Texans. We also want to recognize today's rising stars that are paving the way for Texas' next 200 years. May God bless Texas. This is Tex-Mex TV. And welcome to our latest episode of Tex-Mex TV. My name is Orlando Salazar, your host, and so glad you're here with us today. We have a tremendous guest today, one of the most interesting men in the world, in my opinion. His name is uh, Nico LaHood from San Antonio, Texas. Welcome, Nico. Thank you, brother. That's a wonderful introduction. I don't know, interesting man in the world, but it, since you said in your opinion, I'll take that. Oh, absolutely. Uh, at minimum, the most interesting guy in San Antonio. Yeah. So, Nico, you've had a, an interesting life. Uh, you have an interesting background, just to start out with. You uh, have had an interesting work life. And we're going to talk about all those things. You're a man with a lot of passion and with very strong beliefs. So we want to hear about all that and just get to know you a little bit better. So you grew up in San Antonio. Let's start there. Growing up in San Antonio. And I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't want to put words in your mouth and say you grew up in the barrio, but maybe you did. I don't know. Tell us about growing up. I was I, all my life in San Antonio, 48 years here in San Antonio. I just turned 48 last week. This is by the way. So it's wow, all my, awesome, bro. I didn't all my all my Latino and Hispanic friends always remember it because of the yeah. date, not because probably. But uh, but my mom grew up uh, on the south side, and so I spent a lot of time on the south side with my grandma. My pop grew up on the west side on Morales Street here in San Antonio. He's of, of the Lebanese descent. My mom's Hispanic descent, and so I had a wonderful childhood. I had no complaints about that. I got to see two sides of San Antonio. Uh, underprivileged, at least monetarily, but very privileged in faith and family values, which to me, you're rich when you have the second over the first. And then of course, we lived on another side of town growing up as well. So I, just, I feel blessed. I didn't realize how much of a blessing it was at the time growing up. But now that I look back after 48 years, it was very much a blessing growing up around my grandma. Um, tell us about your last name. LaHood. Yeah. Describe it's, how it, that it, name. You mean who? What? Tell us about your last name. Well, it's Lebanese. It's of Lebanese descent. It's really spelled L A H small H O U D Lahoud. So when my abuelito in 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 Arabic abuelito is is jiddo. So when my jiddo, my pop's pop, came over from Lebanon, he got stuck here. And they Americanized the name like they did to so many Irish and, and Italians and everybody else. So it became La Hood with an H. So a lot of people think it's French. They think it's Spanish. But it's of Lebanese descent, La Hood. And so my pop is full-blooded Lebanese descent. He's the first generation born here in the States or in San Antonio. And then my mom is Mendiola is her maiden name. She's of Hispanic descent. And you grew up in a obviously very Mexican American influence culture in San Antonio. You obviously you speak Spanish, you use all the Tex Mex slang and stuff, and you feel very comfortable with with the guys in the hood, so to speak. You know, no pun intended, the hood, Nico La Hood. In the hood, yeah. I've never heard that before. I'm sure you get that a lot. So yes. tell Nico us about the that, about having that influence, having the Lebanese influence, but still having the Mexican-American influence. You know, it's, it's fascinating. I'm not, I'm not completely fluent in Spanish to my, to my detriment. I pronounce it well because I grew up hearing it. My pop speaks Spanish and he uh, understands Arabic and speaks English. His daddy, Majid, spoke seven languages. Wow. Because before H-E-B and, uh, you know, there was, he sold fruit. And back then, they, the Italians grew up in the Italian neighborhoods, the Germans, the, the, you know, the Lebanese, the Mexicans, and then the Irish and all that stuff. And so he had to communicate to do business with them. So when you came from Lebanon, you spoke French fluently, Arabic, and English. Mm -hmm. When he got here, he learned Spanish, Italian, and I think, I don't know what other language. There's two other languages that he could communicate in. I don't want to fill in the blanks. Mm -hmm. I have to ask my pop again. But he could communicate in seven languages. He was fluent wow. in four. 
And so, and my mom, of course, speaks Spanish, and, but my pop, and I say this without being disrespectful, ignorantly told my mom, no, let them learn English first. Because yeah. back then, to, to talk about the culture back then, you didn't want to have an accent. Well, all four of my children speak Spanish and they're fluent. My wife speaks nothing but Spanish at home, and they speak perfect English. And my pop didn't know any better. He thought he was doing it for the right reason. So I, I speak some Spanish. I understand a lot, and I pronounce it very well. Even my swagger was telling me that my pronunciation is very, very good. And so I just need to get down and practice it. Well, look, to me, you're you're one of us, 100. percent So I'm, I'm going to leave it at that. Now, I'll take it. In in <laughs> looking in for information about you, it says that your dad was a judge. Was he a judge? He was. He was a lawyer practicing. He's 83 years old. Thank God he's still with us on this side of heaven. And he was a lawyer for over 50 years now. He served on the bench here locally as a county court judge. He was a mental health magistrate judge for years before that, for nine years before that. He served in the Army. He retired as a lieutenant colonel. And, you know, he's had an interesting life. And he's a man of honor and one of my heroes. Wow. That's pretty special, man. I mean, that, that is uh, something to look up to. Did you feel any pressure growing up with a dad that had that kind of background? I mean, how, how did that impact you as far as what, you, what your goals were in life and, and how you perceived success? Well, he was my image bearer. He was my standard before I started walking with Christ. I grew up in a religious environment, but I wasn't relational per se. And so, you know, I wanted to be a lawyer from a very young age. I wanted to be a lawyer because I wanted to be like my pop. So... But it wasn't, you know, I, to be, if I have to be real honest with you, I think I took it for granted like a lot of young people do with parents that are blessed because you don't have a perspective when they're young, you know, Orlando. I mean, so I, I lost that perspective. I didn't have that perspective of exactly to appreciate my pop's experience and what he was teaching us. But now that I look back, I'm, I'm, I'm super blessed and I respect that a lot. So not really pressure. It was a standard for me that I wanted to be like my pop. I wanted, I wanted to get married when he got married. I wanted to have all boys because he had all boys i wanted to be a lawyer i you know so i i wanted to emulate him but i didn't feel pressure because he surely didn't put it on me now you had some bumps in the road growing up uh as an individual and your family had a huge huge um not not worse than a bump in the road a tragedy in your family so talk about your kind of personal issues growing up, you're having to deal with kind of your own demons, so to speak. And then what happened after that uh, within your own family? I, I deal with the social experiment called the justice system, right? Now, I didn't know it at the time, but every characteristic flaw we have to me is an identity issue with Christ, an identity crisis with Christ. And I was no different. I was a young, passionate guy arrogant and not arrogant in the definition that you might think so, but just thinking that it was about me, like many young people thought it was. I was working in bars. I never drank, but I worked in bars because I loved the attention, getting in fights. I ended up in 94 at a very young age in my 20s, young, early 20s. I wasn't a child. I was old enough to know better. I was arrested for selling drugs. Very not, I'm not very, obviously not proud of that, but I'm proud of who I am today. I'll never forget my pop when he picked me up from downtown. I was I was more afraid of my own man than I was the system per se. And he was giving me the silent treatment. You know, my pop is not as passionate or energetic as I am. He's kind of old school, laid back. And he didn't say anything to me. And I was like, man, pop, say something. You know, yell at me, cuss me out, tell me when to change my last name. He was a lawyer back then. Can you imagine all the crap he had to see around there? People thinking like, hey, Mike, great job raising your kid. Got arrested for selling drugs. And and he got home and he said, why'd you do it, son? I said, I don't know, Pop, I just, you know, I wanted what you have now. I'm just stupid. And I was giving every excuse in the book. And he said, and I never forgot this. He said, don't ever forget this. It will take you years to build up a good reputation and one second to screw it up. And even though it didn't register with me at the time, as I've lived some life, you know, almost you know, 28 years later or whatever it is, 27 years later, it is true. We see that every day in politics and social and different systems. We see it takes you years to build up a good reputation and one second to screw it up. And so two years after that, on August 15th, 1996 to be exact, I was, I was in the process of trying to turn my life around. He told me, let me tell you what my pop said. This is truly biblical, what he said. 
he didn't reference scripture. He didn't reference, you know, Luke 15, the prodigal son and all that stuff. But he, he definitely referenced a principle. He said, look, you're my son. I love you no matter what. There's nothing you can do that will make me stop loving. And that's when he told me that it'll take you years to build up a good reputation, one second to screw it up. Don't make it up to me. Make it up to yourself. Now, it, it had to have sucked knowing that your kid got arrested for selling drugs when you're a, a well-known person in the justice system. But he never made me feel that way. He never told me that I had lost value to him. Big message. We, we devalue people in our society. My pop, even though he didn't say it, he never acted as I was devalued to him. Well, two years later, August 15th, 1996, at 2.14 in the morning, my older brother was coming home from being out with some friends, and there's folks following him back to the house. And there was four individuals that were carjacking women specifically that night, so they were following a young lady that was following Mike. They get to the house. They try to carjack them, ask for keys and wallets and things of that nature. Mike got in between her and them. And they shot him in the face in my driveway, my parents' driveway. We walked out literally two minutes later, three minutes later. I tell people, you know, I, I, I heard my mom cry the way only a mama can cry, Orlando. You might have heard me say this before. You know, yes. I'm, a, I'm, I'm a daddy. I'm proud to be a daddy. I have four children. And you couldn't blink fast enough before I would give my life for any one of my kids, Papa. But mm -hmm. you, you also couldn't blink fast enough before I would take a life. But, but something inherently God-givenly designed special about a mommy's relationship with their child, with her child. And I heard my mom cry that way. The, the words don't have a way to describe it. I ended up, after the investigation and law enforcement left, I ended up helping loading my brother's body on the gurney to take to the medical examiner's office. And then unfortunately, I helped my pop wash my brother's blood off our driveway. Mm. And it was, that was obviously challenging. And so I went through this journey, Orlando, of, of being trapped in a prism of hate. I was stuck in the, I was incarcerated in a prison of hate, and the world told me I don't blame you. I mean, we're, we're addicted to being victims in our society. Just look outside, you can see it. We love being victims. Go on to Facebook, go on to any social media. We, we can't, we try to out-victimize each other because we want the attention and we have no identity. We don't know who we are and what our purpose in life is. Why are we here? What are we here to do? What's the definition of right and wrong? All these questions have been lost. And so I went through a journey of being angry in the world telling me I don't blame you. And so you can imagine how that played out in the symptom of my life being anger. I was uh, angry. I, I was too machismo, as we say, to go get help. I didn't go get help. I didn't talk to anybody. Uh, so I self-diagnosed myself years later as a functioning angerholic. I was angry at the world. That's an interesting word. I, yeah. I, I, I coined it myself. I just, yeah. It just came to me. I was addicted to my anger. That became my identity, Bob. And, and it, was, it was interesting. And you can only go so far when you're held back by an anchor like that. Yes. You can't reach your god given potential. And so the, there's, the, there's another season in my life, another phase of, of this, this journey. And I always say it's an R-rated journey to Christ, but it was, a very, it was very worth it. Well, obviously, you, you came out of that. You, um, you, you, made it your, you made your way to uh, St. Mary's Law School. You did become an attorney. So talk to us about your law career and then what happened next? I, I started practicing law. I, I had stopped celebrating anything in life because I was still living in that prism of guilt of not being there for my brother when he needed me most, but I was still accomplishing. So all the accomplishments in the world don't do anything unless you're at peace with yourself and you have that purpose. And so um, we started practicing law. I wanted to be, excuse my language, I wanted to be a badass trial lawyer. And so I, that, that was my mission. And so I trained and, and specified in that. And, and I got a reputation for being a trial lawyer. I would say about 13 years into, into practicing law, I uh, felt the Lord put it on my heart to run for office and to, run to be the district attorney of Bear County. Many people told me I could do it. I said, you can't run for office. I go, why, what's wrong? Is there some legal restriction? I can't do it. I've been practicing law for 13 years. What do you mean? I said, well, yeah, but you were arrested. And they whisper like, I don't know that. And the answer is, why, you were, you, you were arrested for selling drugs when you, you know, a long time ago. I was like, I know, does that stop me from running for office? No. I said, okay, well then I'm going to run for office. And I ran, and the first time I ran, God had a different plan. We weren't successful. There had been a 16-year incumbent. She was the first female district attorney in Bear County. And so I, I thought my tour was over. I, I think I showed people the story of redemption. That was a big story. And, of course, they attacked me for being a former drug dealer or whatever. And I get it. That's fine. I talked about it first. And then I thought it was done. Our practice had grown. We were doing well. I, wanted, I think we had two children, Michael, Maya and Michael. And then four years later, like the Lord tapped me on the shoulder and called me off the bench, and I couldn't get away from it. So I ran again, and, 
and this time God had different plans and so served Bear County for four years. Now I saw some, uh, well, there was a Netflix show made about that sad part of your family's life about your, your brother being, being killed, being murdered. But within that show, uh, they showed your career at, at running for DA and parts of the, that show showed the, the guys, the, the personalities in San Antonio that were supporting your candidacy. And you had some pretty big names supporting your candidacy. You had some San Antonio Spurs uh, supporting you. I mean, that, that was pretty cool. Uh, you know, I, I met I met those guys, Tim and Tony, and some of the guys individually, aside from politics, um, and and I met through mutual friends, and we just became friends early on in my legal career. I mean, so I, Tim, I've known Tim for twenty something years. He's godfather to Michael, and you know, it was a very sincere, organic relationship, friendship. It had nothing to do with politics back then, especially. He was non political for sure. And he was almost nonverbal. I used to bust his chops all the time. But you know, so he was—he honored me by saying, "Look, I know Nico's character, and and this is the person that I, I would support, regardless of party or anything else." And so I was very humbled by that. Now you say, regardless of party, t talk to me about party. I mean, this is basically a nonpartisan show, but sure. you you ran as a as a Democrat, correct? I, I well, no, I, I ran as a Christian, but I ran under the Democrat platform. I got you. And so okay. pol 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 politics to me, if you look at the Greek, Orlando, it just means to advocate. Political means to advocate to, for the affairs of the city. We're all politicians, period, end of story. We, we're politicking for something, a sports uh, group or a uh, business or sales or whatever. So we're all politics. But I ran under the Democrat platform at first because I believed the Democrat, back then I was a blue dog Democrat. I haven't changed any of my positions on abortion or anything else or marriage. I mean, it's all been the same, but at one point you could have those very biblically based positions in that platform. And a political party is nothing more than that platform to express your worldview, to express your, your beliefs and which platform lines up with what you believe. So it's really a, a representation of your belief system in my humble opinion. And I, I've said this before, and I talked about this on radio shows before and openly talk about this. And I, I think the Democrat Party has been hijacked. I'm not going to say what Reagan said and other people, you know, the party left me, I didn't leave the party. No, I'm, that, that, I don't, I'm not going to buy into that. I, I believe it was hijacked. You're talking about an ideological shift in the party that you know, blue dog Democrat welcome. Remember in the old days it was a blue dog or a blue dog. There wasn't any leftists right. in the Democrat Party. <laughs> right. Now you have to be. I don't even say liberal. I have liberal friends that I love, and they're great, and I have zero issue with a classical liberal. But that's not what the issue. That's not what the Democrat Party. And we misuse those terms all the time. I try to correct people. I never call. I don't offend my liberal friends by calling leftist liberals. They're leftists. It's a religion, and that leftist ideology that's sprinkled in with Marxism and socialism, as we've seen lately, has hijacked the Democrat Party, unfortunately, and so. I was in, I didn't change one position that I've ever had from the first time I ran to the second time I ran to how I served in office. So I, I very publicly walked away from the Democrat Party. Well, what would you say was your highlight uh, as a, as the district attorney in San Antonio? What one or two things that would say marked your career as the DA? I, I humbly think the culture. People enjoyed going to work. They they were purpose driven. They they knew. You can see behind me, oh, I'm sorry, this side on your feet. It said, do what's right, not what's easy. That was in my office as you left my, my office at the DA's office. Always do what's right, not what's easy. I don't care about political backlash. If you're, if you're doing what is ethical and legal, and to me, moral, well, then I'll back you up and I'll stand in front of you. And I showed that over and over again in the office. And so do what's right. And people, I think, I, I gave them the autonomy. You can't micromanage 500 people, Orlando, and Apollo. We had 200 lawyers and 300 support staff. I mean, you can't micromanage that, nor should I, that I want to. can't be efficient that way. So I want to say the culture, number one. I think people were, were purpose-driven. Uh, we were fearless in the sense that if we're going to stand for truth. I was not politically correct. And I always tell people that I was a crappy politician, but I think I was a pretty damn good statesman. And so that was it. Number one is the culture. Number two is that case that a lot of people in Texas knew about, Janine Jones. Uh, it was a 30-year-old murder case that two DAs before me said we couldn't do anything about. She is suspected in murdering 30 infants, many of them in their mommy's arms. Oh, my God. And she had been, she had been convicted. If you look up Janine Jones, she was called the angel of death by the media back then. And so she was serving a sentence 
uh, old under the old law life sentence, which she was going to parole out in April or March, April, I think it's March, sorry, of, of 2018. And I made a promise when I was running for office that we would look into those cases and, and, and humbly, and, and we have great lawyers, Jason Goss, who works with me at the office. All the guys here were former prosecutors with me in the office. He led the case. I signed into the case, and we had five new indictments on her, and that woman will meet the Lord from prison, which she should. And so we got five new indictments, and no one said we could get. So that was a legal accomplishment. But then we, 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 I started a conviction integrity unit, which was only the ninth in the country, third in the state. Um, we started a restorative justice peace model, and we did a lot of different programs where people that were nonviolent were given opportunities to turn their life around like I had. But then the violent people, the people that we're scared of, we need to get them out of the community, the people that piss us off, so to speak, or make us angry. That's, how can we help them turn their life around so they can be productive members of society? And so that was kind of the culture. I, can, I don't want to give you a laundry list of all the things we did. We did a lot of individual programs that, that will be a lot of legal jargon to you. But um, those, those, I think, are the highlights. But there's a lot more. Well, you squeezed a, a lot into four years, man. Way to go. <laughs> well, I didn't do it by myself. We squeezed it into four years. I couldn't have done anything. Yeah. I was just the, I was just the guy that was foolish enough to put his name on the plaque, you know. But I had a phenomenal people that I worked with every day, and I always tried to elevate them and give them honor where honor is due, and then brag about everybody else. Well, now you have a family, um, you have a private practice again. Uh, tell me about your kids. Tell me about your beautiful wife. Yeah. No, I'm. You met her, Orlando. Oh, yeah. I married up, and you agree yeah. with me. Well, didn't we all? Um, yeah, no, Bodicita, she married down, but I married up, and, and she's, a, she's a joy, and I'm honored to be her husband. And then we have four children, Maya, Michael, Leah, and Zaiter. Zaiter is named after my grandpa. That's him on my lap right there. Zaiter is a very traditional Lebanese name, and Zaiter, Z-A-I-T-E-R, Zaiter. And so my, my aunt cried when, I, when she found out we named him after my grandpa. And those are my, those are my delight. My kids, those are my world. Christ, and then my family. Well, I know that uh, you're a man of faith. I mean, it's been obvious through this whole interview, you, you talk about your faith. Um, so you're very involved with your church. Talk to us about your faith. Yeah, no, well, look, it, I always tell people the worst advice we were given growing up, Orlando, is the two things you don't talk about is what? Religion and politics, right? What horrible advice. Religion to me is your worldview. Politics is what you're advocating. Okay, let's just, I'm gonna try to break it down a little bit. So if I'm supposed to live in peace with my neighbor, how should I, how can I not talk about my worldview and what I'm advocating for? We have to, and I think it's horrible. And we're seeing the results of a, a society that was raised not to talk about worldview and advocacy. And so I believe in the Judeo-Christian worldview. I have a biblical worldview. That means every position I have goes through the lens of, of the Bible and I can defend it from science to everything else. I mean, the, 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 I think the church humbly, I, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but I think the church has handed over a lot of topics to the secular world. And, and we're seeing it in the, in the data about young people that don't believe in a biblical worldview. It's very alarming to me. And I'm just real practical. You know that. I'm, I mean, I talk real raw sometimes, and I'm, I'm respecting your platform here. I do prison ministry, Orlando. I've done halfway houses. I talk to young people. I talk to at-risk kids, and I never label them that. I'm just telling you what society does. And I want to give them hope. And the only answer to every societal ailment is, is, a, is, a, is a first century Jew named Jesus Christ. That, he's a historical figure. I've studied the life of Jesus Christ when I was going through my storm and when I was stuck in the prism of hatred. And I looked at it like a case that I look at evidence. I studied the most famous murder scene in the history of mankind, which was the murder of that first century Jew, Jesus Christ. And so I studied that murder scene, his crucifixion, and I was persuaded by the evidence that I saw. And so. Now that I said, okay, I knew I grew up religious, but I didn't grow up in a relationship. What do I do with this information now? It, it affects everything. It affects marriage. It affects life. It affects profession. It affects being a daddy. It affects enemies. It affects trials and tribulations. It affects everything. And so I, because I'm persuaded by the enemies. Well, um, we appreciate you being on the show today, Nico. Um, I know that you have aspirations. You know, what, my introduction talks about our heroes of the past and rising stars, and I think you're kind of a combination. I think you've done some great things already, but I think your star is still rising. So what's next? What, what do you think is out there for you? 
You know, I thank Orlando. I'm humbled by that. I mean that sincerely because your opinion matters to me, brother. I, I, when we met, I knew that we were kindred spirits and that we, you know, we both serve the same God and we have the same family values and traditional values of our ethnic backgrounds and things of this nature. But thank you for that. Look, I, I'm working. I've been working on obedience for the last many years. I'm not. I, I really don't try to overthink things. I, we need to be deliberate about life. No, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that you don't plan and you don't try to achieve something. But I always try to make sure that I'm obedient. And so right now, um, January will be two years since I've been out of the office. And my family's enjoyed having me back. My kids, I mean, I, I worked six, seven days a week. It took me three months to figure out what to do on weekends. I mean, I was always working <laughs> yeah. and talking. And so I've enjoyed this season, Orlando. I really have enjoyed this season. But uh, so I'm doing a lot of ministry, you know, that through podcasts and different talks that I do. I really want to convince people about the worldview that I believe is the most credible one. So I'll be obedient. You know, I do have that desire to be in office again, even though politics is not conducive for good people. Hear me. This is the irony. Politics is not conducive for good people, but we need good people in politics. Yeah. And, and people are dissuaded by it because you know, a bunch of backstabbing fake ass people in there. But that's so be it. You know, Jesus was around a bunch of them himself, namely Judas. Right. So so you just go with courage and make sure that you're doing it for the right reasons and humility, but, but 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 fearlessness at the same time. That's a hard balance and it's impossible in the flesh, in my humble opinion. And I speak the truth and I'll always conform to the truth and humble myself. And then but I will always champion the truth. And so I, I'm, I'm kind of open. I'll, let, I'll wait for the Lord to give me the green light. And he usually do it through Davi. She gave me the green light before. I wouldn't have run without her permission to yeah. support. So you I wouldn't do anything without says, her. Or Lord and then mama. But, <laughs> yeah, I always, I always tell my, my, my daughter, I, we teach on biblical marriages. And people always freak out over Ephesians 5 and submission and all that stuff. So I ask my own. Well, I'm going to I'm going to ask you to hang on a little bit. And Sarah, I'm going to ask you to hold off on this because usually I do a via con Dios segment on my own. But I'm going to okay. ask you to do it with me today, Nico, because because hey. okay. I want you to be a part of this. But in the meantime, you. uh, as you're watching the show, if there's uh, some idea or person that you think would be great to have on Tex-Mex TV, there'll be a, an email address uh, at the bottom of the screen. And if there's somebody you think would uh, be a great guest for us on Tex-Mex TV, we invite you to please send in your suggestions, and we'd love to have your input. And we do finish every show with a Via Con Dios segment. And Nico, since you're, you know probably Scripture way a hundred times better than I do, I'm going to throw something out, and then I'm going to get you to comment on it for me. Oh, because of everything no pressure, you've right? gone through, no pressure. It's just Philippians 4.13. What does it say? Uh, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, but, but, but Philippians 4.11 is just as important. What Paul is saying to the Philippi, read Philippians 4.11, he says, I've learned to be content in all circumstances. That's right. And then it leads up to, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so, you know, God is not um, grandpa God, he's daddy God. He cares about our maturity more than our comfort and our happiness. He cares about the joy and the peace that comes through our relationship with him in this broken world knowing that it's worth it once we are called off this earth. Now, he wants us to be blessed, and he wants us to have an abundant life, no doubt about that, but he also tells us that tribulation's coming. James 1, 2 through 4, Romans 5, 3 through 5, 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18. It's very clear, John 16, 33, very clear that tribulation's coming, but have heart, have hope. God has overcome the world, and it's worth it. So I'm not playing short ball, Orlando. You know that. You've heard me say this before. God, if the Lord leaves me on this earth for 90 years, 95 years, he just get it. I'm not playing for that. I'm playing for eternity. And that motivates everything that I do. Well, and to kind of tag on to that, and you can help wrap us up in just a minute or two, but also Romans 8, he says we're more than conquerors. And so... In Christ Jesus. In, that's right. And nothing can separate us from the love of God, right, Nico? Romans 8. But in between that, Orlando, is Romans 8, 28, that God works all things out for the good that's of those right. who love Him, are called by His purpose. So that's relational and obedience. And that's what I've worked on for, for over 15 years now. Well, Nico, thank you so much for joining us. You're an awesome man, and you have an awesome Thanks, family. You've done so much already for your community, for all of us here in Texas, and we can't wait to see what comes next. So thank you so much for joining us today. I'm humbled, brother. God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for being with us on this episode of Tex-Mex TV, and we'll see you again on the next show. Thank you.